UNFTR. Welcome to Phone a Friend. My guest today is Rashid Khalidi, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University. Professor Khalidi received his BA from Yale in 1970 and Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford in 1974. He's co-editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies and was president of the Middle East Studies Association and an advisor to the Palestinian delegation to the Madrid and Washington Arab-Israeli peace negotiations from October 1991 until June of 1993. He's the author of eight books, including, most recently, The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. His research inspired a significant amount of the work in our series on Palestine, and it's a privilege to welcome him to the show today. Professor Khalidi, thank you so much for your time today in what is certainly an emotional and strenuous time. Thank you for being part of the show. Thanks for having me. So our audience has heard us reference a great deal of your perspective from both lectures and the Hundred Years' War on Palestine, which I found to be an invaluable resource in putting our series together. And one of the things that I appreciated most was your willingness to include personal family history, which I think helped really connect with, uh, with the reader. Most notably, the archival information that you uncovered and unearthed from your great, great, great uncle, Youssef Dia. Um, so if it's OK, I'd like to begin actually on a personal note to ask you what it was like going through those archives to connect with history in such a personal way. I, uh, it was like a series of revelations. Um, some of the material I knew was there. Um, because other researchers had seen it before. Some of this material that I uncovered in the course of writing this book, some of the family material I had never, I'd never known about. Um, and it was, I mean, moving and as a historian, exciting um, mm -hmm. to discover things that actually had some <laughs> significance at the time and, and I think are, are revealing uh, 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 for us today. Yeah. Um, you know, something that your narrative accomplished for me as a reader was to kind of contextualize the relationship between Jews and Arabs of the Ottoman Empire in a way that I really never connected with before and didn't understand. And what struck me was the fraternal nature of this bond Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, how authentic would you characterize that bond, I would say, prior to the Great War, including the relationship between the settlers of the first Aliyot who were escaping anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe? What was right. that bond really like on the ground through your research? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not the one who's done the really important research on this. A colleague of mine by the name of Selim Tamari has written a wonderful book about society in, in Jerusalem in particular before World War I, um, focusing on a man called uh, Wasif Jahari. And his work and the work of other, uh, actually several of my students have worked on this. Several people did PhDs and those are book, the books are out now. Uh, several, uh, actually two of them are Israeli. Um, and what is clear is that for the overwhelming majority of the Jewish community in Palestine, not including many of the settlers of the first Aliyah, um, there was a relatively comfortable relationship, and in some cases, close relationships between especially Muslims and Jews. Um, I think a lot of Palestinian Christians were influenced by European anti-Semitism, actually. People went to Catholic and, and, and Protestant missionary schools, and in many cases picked up uh, some, and Russian missionary schools. And, you know, if you think of the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, Protestants, um, there was ingrained institutional anti-Semitism in a lot of what the missionaries were teaching. But I think that generally speaking, the relationship was quite close. Now, the settlers did not come to integrate with local society. Uh, at the outset, many of them were not overtly political. Many of them were not as separatist as, as, as the settlement process developed over time. And in many cases, there were good relationships in the countryside uh, between the rural population uh, and and the, the new the new settlers. Um, there were do several dozen of these small settlements before 1914, but the overwhelming majority of the Jewish population in Palestine then and now was always urban. Uh, the people in the settlements were, t were a minority, and to this day, the rural population of Israel is a, is a small minority of the, of the total population. 
Um, and the relationship in the cities was generally good, though as the number of immigrants grew and as political Zionism influenced them, and many of those who were coming were not just fleeing persecution, but were choosing to come to Palestine because they believed that this was the place to resolve anti-Semitism via Zionism, via establishing a Jewish majority state. Um, relations soured in the 20s and the 30s. Um, but before the war, uh, even after the rise of you know political Zionism at the end of the 19th century, uh, especially with the older, more established, the older established Jewish communities in Palestine, relations were generally good. Well, I, you know, I want to get to current events, but you know, before we jump there, uh, if we could stay in this period for a moment, because you're talking about sort of the character and the nature of settlements and the difference between rural, urban and rural landscapes. You know, when you spoke about your grandfather's generation and how they would have identified as uh, as Arabs, proud speaking Arabic. Um, and, uh, you know, religious to a degree, but they would have seen themselves more as related to their villages and their family relationships. Uh, I think that's true of a lot of, um, of cultures around this time in the in the industri- in the in the dawn of the industrial age, sort of this tension between the, the feudalism and what was coming with the with the growth of capitalism. Um, and it, it kind of occurred to me that as I was reading your narrative that Palestine, could have been a remarkable proving ground for socialism and the socialist theories that were developing at the time. Uh, And I did notice that a lot of prominent current Marxists and socialists have lauded your work because you took great care to connect the concept of private property beginning with the Ottoman land codes in in 58 and through the imperial exploits of the the Western nation states and how sort of capitalism disrupted a lot of what would have been the natural um, I say maybe evolution of the economic conditions. Now, I know it's an, an impossible game of what if, but can you speculate on what the economic conditions of, of Palestine and how they would have fared if not for the imperial exploits of the, of the allied powers? I mean, that's an, that's an impossible exercise. Um, I, I think that capitalism was marching on all over the globe and, and the, 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 involvement of Palestine and other parts of the Middle East in the global capitalist world order was inexorable, and, and certainly at that time. And so the, the Ottoman land code of 1858 that you mentioned was part of the development of capitalist relations in agriculture and part of the alienation of, of farmers who had previously had rights, inalienable rights from their land. It's, it became private property and in mo- many cases, it was no longer theirs. And I think that fundamentally changed a whole number of things. It made land purchase and land sale uh, in ways that were not previously possible, Um, not just possible, but necessary. I mean, land becomes a commodity, uh, which it really wasn't before 1858, not at least in in the rural areas. In the cities, it always was. And in the areas immediately around the cities, it always was. You could own a private orchard in Damascus or whatever on the outskirts of Damascus, but the vast agricultural lands, you know, to the south of Damascus and the Haran were not owned by individuals. Right. They were collectively farmed or farmed by individuals who had inalienable rights as long as they paid taxes and as long as they cultivated the land. All of right. that changes with the land code. It changes, of course, very slowly because the Ottomans don't impose this everywhere at the same time. They can't, they don't have the governing mechanisms. And in fact, one of the problems in Palestine today in the 21st century is that much of the land was never finally, even under the British mandate uh, after World War I, was not finally registered. And so one of the things that Israel does is exploit this failure to complete the registration and in effect capitalization of land, um, which Mm -hmm. never, never was completed under the Ottomans or even for that matter under the British. So, okay, so when we think about the, the evolution of the economies, and, and, and again, I, I just have to say that I think one of the things that you clarified so well, coming from a, a, a novice Western lens, was that this was not some entirely some backward, strictly Bedouins intent type of rural, I mean, there, was, there were marketplaces developing, and as you mentioned, they... It was participating in the in in the capitalist experiment that was growing all over the all over right. the globe, 
And so it, I've, I've actually found it profound that there were mature marketplaces that the urban centers had been connecting at this time. Right. Um, and so when, when we when we get past, I guess, the it, the interruptions of the Great Wars, obviously, which changed the landscape in totality everywhere on Earth. Uh, and it also changed the, the, the nature of power and the structures of power in that region. There, it seemed to me that the turning points after 48, after 47 and 48, kind of came fast and furious in, when we're talking about Palestine proper. So whether it's from, you know, beginning with the Arab revolts, through the Nakba, through the Six-Day War, then through the October War, these, these pivots and turning points just kept happening. Right. My sense was... In, in reading you and other work, that there was another pivot in the late 70s with the the, the far-right surge of the Likud party in Israel, uh, but then also the uh, right through the invasion of Lebanon, that changed the character of the region and the attitudes in a, in a more significant way than, than before. And I'm wondering if you see any parallels... Because for me, it seems like past October 7th and what's happening in Gaza right now that we've sort of crossed a Rubicon that I don't know if we know what happens next. The only other time that I can sort of find in in your analysis and other analyses would be that period up through the invasion of Lebanon. Are there correlations and how would you contextualize what's happening today in a historical context of the, of the story of Palestine? Yeah, I mean, in the book, I talk about declarations of war and those are political, really. Mm -hmm. There are other kinds of upheavals, social, political. One of them, as you point out, is World War I. Um, another is the Arab Revolt of 36, 39, actually as important in some ways as the Nakba. Another is the Nakba. And each of these are not just political events, but I think more importantly, hugely important socially and economically. Um, and I think you're actually right in pointing to the late, the 70s and the period up to the 82 Israeli invasion of Lebanon for two reasons. And they're mainly, they're both political, but they're, they also have a social, socioeconomic aspect. Um, the first reason is, is that there is a change in Palestinian political thinking in the 1970s. As a result, uh, I would argue, of the 1973 war. The 1973 war, Egypt and, Israel, Egypt and Syria go to war to retrieve the territories occupied in 1967. Both accept Security Council Resolution 242, which means they accept the existence of the State of Israel. They accept that the lines of June 1967 are the borders of Israel right. with their acceptance of 242. And they say all we're fighting for is to liberate the territories that Israel occupied during the June 67 war. That changes the landscape for the Palestinians. And the, 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 if you watch the evolution of the PLO from 1974 onwards, right up until they in 1988, with the Declaration of Independence, they they accept partition, they accept 242, they accept a two-state solution, they renounce violence, coded as terrorism. Um, if you watch that evolution from the 70s up to the end of the 80s, this is a profound political transformation. The Palestinians are no longer talking about liberating Palestine. They're talking about what the Arab states were talking about in 1973. The territories occupied in 1967. That's the PLO position. It's the PLO position to this day, by the way. Um, the other uh, the other change, and it has all kinds of social and, and economic implications, as well as political, is the shift in Israel. And it's the change, as you pointed out, uh, over to Likud from the previous governments that were dominated by the Labour Party. From 1977 onwards, Israeli politics has been completely dominated by Likud. There were a few Labour governments in, 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 the, in the meantime, in, the, in 75, uh, sorry, 72 to 70 six or seven, seven, which did other not period. end well. I know that. My point <laughs> is that overall Likud has dominated Israeli politics ever yeah. since 1977. And that has brought about all kinds of changes, not just in the Israeli position, whereby the core outlook of Israeli politics is establishing hegemony and sovereignty over the entirety of the land of Israel, meaning from the river to the sea. And in fact, that is the electoral program of Likud in 1973, between the sea and the river, there shall be Jewish, uh, Israeli sovereignty only. Right. That's that's actually the driving force of Likud, then and now, and uh, of the parties even further to the right, which are in some cases spin-offs of Likud, in some cases far more extreme than mm -hmm. Likud. That is the same ideology. 
So that's a big shift. And what does that mean? That means that between the 70s and today, the number of illegal Israeli settlers in the occupied territories goes from under 100,000 or around 100,000 to 750,000. I mean, that's a huge demographic economic change. They mm-hmm. control almost 60, over 60% of the West Bank and most of the territory of East Jerusalem. Uh, so there's economic impl- uh, impact. There's a, there's, a, there's a demographic impact. Actually, uh, they can, talk you, can about you pause? That number to a million. Can um, you pause to, to, to speak to the economic stranglehold? Because I don't think that that's appreciated enough in the dialogue because we get so focused on wars and skirmishes and events right. like that. But the economic stranglehold that was the, the shift in attitudes towards um, free trade and mobility within the occupied territories changed dramatically. Can you speak to that a little bit and, and right. how that impacted the local economy? Well, the economy of the occupied territories is integrated into the Israeli economy. And the Oslo Accords of, of the mid-1990s don't change that one bit. Um, and so you have different forms of exploitation, uh, quarries, water, uh, other extraction of resources from the West Bank and uh, Gaza, the Gaza Strip for that matter. Um, uh, uh, continue apace. Uh, uh, Palestinian workers uh, work freely in Israel from the beginning of the occupation right up to the implementation of the Oslo Accords in the mid 1990s. The, the situation then changes, and you begin to have what is called separation, which basically means the bantuza- bantusization and the enclosure of the Gaza Strip of different parts of the West Bank, and a cutting of many of the economic ties with a continued incorporation of the Palestinian economy in a limited way into the Israeli economy. There's very good work that's been done on this by UNCTAD, United Nations Commission on Trade and Development, which shows how the subordination of the Palestinian economy to the Israeli economy worked. So when we think about these periods and then we think about what is happening right now, um, it's always impossible to speculate on on what's going to happen next, obviously, especially in times of war and such mass uh, destruction. But is there any historical precedent that you see for what's occurring right now? Do you hear some echoes from the past that give you an idea of what might happen next? Or are you finding this moment unique in the severity of it? And are you are you gravely concerned for, for what comes next? I am gravely concerned for what comes next. And I do think that this is a a rupture of some sort, Um, maybe a paradigm shift. Um, On the other hand, it has to be said that the Palestinians have suffered various phases of ethnic cleansing and expulsion. So what is happening in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, where Israel is trying to push as much of the population of that part of the Gaza Strip into the southern part of the Gaza Strip, is not unprecedented. Palestinians have been pushed out by Israel since 1948, they did it again in 1967, three quarters of a million people in 1948, maybe a quarter of a million, 200,000 or a quarter of a million in, in 67 after the war. So this is not unprecedented. And this has been, I mean, this demographic push establishing a, a secure, large Jewish majority in as much of poss- as possible of what is perceived, especially by the could as the land of Israel in which there's one people with the right of national self-determination. That's that's part of the Israeli constitution, by the way. That's not mm-hmm. some crazy uh, extremist lawmaker spouting. That's a the the, the nation sta- Israel nation state of the Jewish people law passed by the Knesset in 2018. There's one people with the right of self-determination uh, in that land, and that is the, the Jewish people. So within that vision, pushing Palestinians out is a necessary component. Um, it was in 48, it was in 67, and, and we're seeing it in at least the northern part of Gaza. The fear was, and I think that fear hasn't fully abated, that there would be an attempt to push people out of Gaza and therefore out of historic Palestine. The Israeli government intended to do that. There's no question, because the United States would not have tried to broker such a deal unless it was trying to do so on behalf uh, of the Israeli government. Uh, and there have been various calls by Israeli officials for the depopulation of Gaza and their expulsion into the Sinai. It's not been publicly adopted, but we know that Secretary Blinken ran around the Middle East as a uh, errand boy for Israel, trying to get Jordan and trying to get Egypt to accept people expelled from the Gaza Strip, a shameful, disgraceful episode in American history. 
um, the president actually sent to Congress on the 20th of October a, a request for funding, mainly for Ukraine and Israel, but which included money for pushing people out of Gaza. I mean, that's in the request that's before Congress today. You can read it under the title Migration. And th there are various uh, elements there which make it clear that they were intending to help Israel to ethnically cleanse part or at least part of the population of the Gaza Strip. So I think that's, a, that's an ongoing fear, frankly, of Palestinians, given their history. So if we t if we talk about actors in the region, then uh, I know that um, like I said I we're we're both in New York, so you know we we get a lot of opinions from a lot of sides, and uh, many Jewish family members and uh, you know friends and colleagues of mine uh, and Israeli friends will say, you know where where are the Arab countries and how come they never show up. And mm -hmm. so in understanding what's happening, obviously, I, I think the economic catastrophe in Lebanon places them in a little bit of a different situation. The civil war and the strife inside Syria certainly takes them out of uh, any sort of play right now. But there are other neighboring entities. You mentioned Egypt. We talk about Jordan. Jordan, to me, is a, is a bit of a mystery because of the sort of tenuous his history between the Palestinian people and the Hashemite dynasty and the interplay between the two, sometimes great, sometimes not. Um, there is a, I get the sense of, of self-determination, um, the desire for self-determination among the Palestinian people, which should be a fundamental right and seems to have been to, afforded to everybody else in the world. Um, but not everybody else, not, not the everybody Kurds, else, for example. Yes, not everybody else. I don't want to be, I don't want to be glib. But, um, but Jordan to me is a curiosity because I, I don't have a lot of visibility into it and I don't feel like I've read a lot of great credible work on that. Can you explain the relationship as it is today between the Jordanian people, but then the Jordanian ruling class and how they view this conflict and what role they might play in, in the days and years ahead? Yeah, let me, let me say something about the Arab countries. Most of them are ruled by anti-democratic, unrepresentative governments, yeah. governments that do not represent their people, governments that were merrily sailing along towards normalization before October 7th, in many cases, mm -hmm. uh, which is, according to every opinion poll that has ever been taken, opposed by overwhelming majorities of Arabs in every country in which polling has taken place. So the people want something for the Palestinians, before there can be normalization, the governments don't care very much about the Palestinians, as is evidenced by their apparent willingness. And in some cases, their willingness, they've done it to normalize with Israel without anything being done about the oppression of the Palestinians. So the governments and the peoples are in different places on this issue, on the issue of Palestine. They would just rather forget about it. And they're afraid of Palestinian militancy. And they know that it causes problems in their relationships with the United States. And these are regimes that are dependent on the United States in different ways. They have a lack of legitimacy. They have internal security problems. The United States mm -hmm. helps them to hold down their peoples. The United States is a great anti-democratic force in the Middle East, helping these regimes to stay in power across the Gulf, across North Africa, Egypt, and so forth. So that's the general picture. What has happened since October 7th is that the overwhelming support of people in the Arab countries for the Palestinians has broken through that layer of government repression. And you've had right. demonstrations across the Arab world, some of the biggest in 12 years, in fact, some of the first in Egypt in 12 years, actually. Now, Jordan is a very special case. Jordan, first of all, annexed the West Bank and, and in 1949, right. after, the 67, after the 48 war, and extended citizenship to all Palestinians in Jordan. So a very large majority, or at least a majority of the population of Jordan today, even after the loss of the West Bank, is made up of people who are descended from Palestinians or are Palestinians. Um, and that means it has a very peculiar polity. Uh, it's also not a real democracy. It's a country ruled by a monarchy, a security service, and an army. That's what it always was. Yeah, they have elections, but if you look at how the electoral districts are drawn up, you would see that the term gerrymandering barely begins to suffice to dis describe the outrageous way in which uh, uh, electoral districts are drawn and in which the, the parliament um, um, is, is, is therefore elected. Um, and it has no power almost in any case. So Jordan is a special case in multiple ways. Everybody there is a citizen. The largest single number of Palestinians expelled in 1948 became Jordanian citizens. 
and are completely integrated into the Jordanian society and economy and culture. In fact, Palestinians dominate much of the Jordanian economy, much of Jordanian culture. Um, so it is in multiple ways a special case. Now, Jordan has one overriding, or at least one overriding uh, objective, which is to not be drowned with more Palestinian refugees. Right. It suffered this in 48. It was a tiny country with a very small, weak economy. It suffered again in 1967. It was a small country with a weak economy. And this would be a disaster on a humanitarian and a social and an economic level for Jordan, not to speak of the politics. You know, you add more Palestinians to Jordan, as you can imagine, from the point of view of not only the Hashemites and the security services, but from the point of view of the Palestinians themselves. Why would anybody want to allow Israel to ethnically cleanse Palestinians at the expense of Jordan or any other Arab country? The idea that Blinken would run around the Middle East and try and peddle this outrageous idea is an indication of the absolute ignorance that the mm -hmm. people running our foreign policy uh, suffer from. I mean, anyone with any any sense of the politics and history of this part of the world would know that this is just a non-starter. No government right. would accept to be a to, to to do the dirty work for Israel. I mean, it's it's inconceivable that they could have thought they could get away with this. But it shows that the level of blindness and the degree to which they just are following an Israeli playbook uh, in Washington, in the Biden administration, and in our Congress, and unfortunately in our media and in many other places. Um, when when we think about um, actually, so when we put Palestine in a political context and and I guess maybe before the separation, the, the true political separation of uh, Gaza from the West Bank, when we go back to the time of Arafat, um, uh, it, it again, it strikes me that I'm, I'm kind of impressed by his resiliency and his ability to 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 shift over time Who's? in order to Arafat. Oh. To to stay in power, but not really all that impressed by his his statecraft, and and it feels to me like he really never had a sense of what was happening on the ground, which is what allowed for the the rise of of Hamas and then other political interests and political groups throughout the territories to gain the 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 will and the trust of the people. There's so much light on the creation and the birth of Hamas at this point right now. Um, can you talk about the difference between the foundational elements of Hamas as as an Islamist group, but one that was developed for social structures and political representations, right. and its and then its uh, its turn over over decades towards uh, militism, the, the the type of which I, I I would say that we saw with Fatah and we saw with the IDF and we saw with other organizations that that preceded it, but this seems right. to be maybe of a different character. Right. How do the people of Palestine? So, what it, what was that transition, and how do the people of Palestine view Hamas as an organization? Since so many of them have only grown up with them. Okay, I mean those are those are multiple complex Sorry. questions. I'll try and answer <laughs> one or two of them. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert on the rise of Hamas. Um, Tarek Bakoni, Sarah Roy, Jean Pierre Fidu have written f wonderful books on the subject. So, anybody who's really interested shouldn't read me. <laughs> they should read these these people uh, and others. Um, secondly, Hamas arises in 1987 at just the moment that I was earlier talking about, when the PLO shifted from armed struggle to negotiations, shifted from the liberation of all of Palestine to acceptance of a two-state solution and a Palestinian state in the territories that were occupied in 1967 and came to be accepted as an interlocutor by the United States and eventually by Israel. Uh, by the time Prime Minister Rabin comes in in 92, uh, Israel agrees to negotiate directly with the PLO. This shift, which incidentally is extremely popular among Palestinians mm -hmm. and is a shift by the universally recognized representative of the Palestinians, of course, is not recognized at the time by Israel and, and nor for a while by the United States, but is something that accompanies, or how should I put it, that at the same time as this shift is taking place, uh, Hamas arises in 1987, arguing, no, we have to liberate all of Palestine, and armed struggle is the only way. And it's put in a 
extraordinary Islamic rhetoric. I mean, you have to read the original charter to realize where these people were coming from. Um, it, it, it's well worth reading. It's a, quite a shocking document, actually. They've changed. They have, they've revised this entirely in, in, in recent years, in the, in the last a couple of decades. But you go back to 87, and what they were basically saying, besides the Islamist rhetoric, was you failed, you, you've, you've abandoned uh, liberation of all of Palestine, and you've abandoned armed struggle. We're taking up that flag. They do not gain enormous support until the PLO fails to achieve the goals that Arafat and, and the PLO thought they were going to achieve through the Oslo process. You have to look at what happened in the 1990s. PLO goes, PLO sends a delegation, I was an advisor to it, to Madrid and Washington. We negotiate for two years. We get nowhere. It is clear that this is not going to lead to a Palestinian state. It is not going to roll back settlement. It will not end the occupation. We get that from the Israelis and the Americans. This is your ceiling. Live with it. That's what we're told. And then maybe later we'll discuss these things. And we know that those things were never on the table, in fact, it turns out. Arafat accepts that. By the end of the 1990s, Palestinian GDP per capita goes down. Palestinian movement is severely restricted. In 1992, three, four, five, I was living in Jerusalem a lot of that time. You could go anywhere with West Bank license plates. You could go to the Golan Heights. You could go to Ilat. You could go to Gaza. You could go to Tel Aviv. You could go to Haifa. Nobody was restricted in their movement except a very limited number of people, and there were very few checkpoints. Uh, tens of thousands of Palestinians worked inside Israel. People go, went to the beach, for heaven's sakes, in Jaffa. Hmm. All of this changes with Oslo. Walls, checkpoints, uh, uh, restrictions into area A, area B, and so forth. Uh, so GDP per capita goes down. Movement is restricted. The occupation is further extended and entrenched, and settlements continue to expand. Why does Hamas gain currency? Because they say, yo, you abandoned liberation, you mm -hmm. abandoned armed struggle, and look what it's gotten us. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the drivers of the Second Intifada of the early 2000s with the suicide bombings and everything that followed. And I, I think that the abject failure of the international community, of Israel and the United States, to make any movement towards the things that the Palestinians expected and hoped for in the early 1990s is the reason for such popularity as Hamas has. In other words, so, you told us to go diplomacy. This is what it got us. A much right. worse situation than we were in before. So it's interesting because you mentioned that point. Uh, as you were in the room during these negotiations in Oslo that... Um, I wasn't in Oslo. These are the, the Washington it, it, talks up to excuse me. June of 93. Oslo was taking place behind our backs and without our knowledge simultaneously in Oslo. And so... Elsewhere. One of the narratives that emerges is that the terrorist activity uh, on the uh, kind of, I, I guess, derailed all of the talks and it looked like it was going to be intractable and that maybe gains would have been made and there was closer to at least a, a path towards a statehood and recognition for the Palestinian people. But then you had the uh, the event in uh, where Baruch Goldstein walks in and murders worshippers in, in the mosque uh, and then you have reprisals and attacks and it. And the world sort of once again throws up its hands and says, oh, these people simply can't get along. But you're suggesting that during those talks, these things were never going to be accomplished no. anyway. And that was window no. dressing on the side that that could be used for to, to basically dis disclaim the entire process. Is that I mean, what is described as a peace process, which is supposed to lead to a so-called two state solution, has to be examined in terms of the Israeli position to which the United States slavishly adheres always and invariably. So we look at the Israeli position and the Americans just arrange the furniture around whatever the Israelis want. The Israeli position is perfectly clear. The most forthcoming of Israeli leaders were Rabin, Barak, and later Ehud Olmert, briefly in the, in the early 2000s. Rabin's last speech to the Knesset is well worth reading before he's assassinated because he, he was considered to have gone too far by the people who are now in power, i.e. The, the right wing political forces killed him because they thought he'd gone much too far. He says, we're offering less than a state. You have to take this man seriously. He's the man who pushed the Israeli position far beyond what anybody before him had done. He had agreed to negotiate with the PLO. He recognized the PLO as representative of the Palestinian people. He recognized there was a Palestinian people. 
Nobody had done that before. No Israeli leader ever did that before. And a lot of the present lot don't accept any of that today. But he said it will be less than a state. And he said we will maintain control over the Jordan River Valley. And what does that mean? That means you're talking about no sovereignty. That means you're talking about something less than statehood. That means you're essentially talking about autonomy under Israeli rule, permanent Israeli rule. Mm -hmm. Barat changes the terms a little bit at the Camp David negotiations, and then he flounces out and says, uh, there's no partner. Uh, 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 Olmer changes the terms as well. But in every case, what Israel is talking about is less than a state. Now, could that have been changed were it not for suicide bombing and so on and so forth? I don't know. Those are counterfactuals and, and you know alternative histories. What I will say is that it is clear from these positions, at least, that th- 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 what was being talked about was not a two-state solution. It was a one state and a one Bantustan solution, or a one state and an autonomy solution, something mm-hmm. of that sort. Um, and, and that didn't meet Palestinian minimal aspirations. I mean, Israel has always controlled the population registry. You can't register unless they accept that you exist. It is always controlled entry and exit from the occupied territories. You can't get in, you can't get out without their permission. It's always controlled import and export. You can't have an independent economy. It's also always controlled the currency. I could go on and on and on. Those are the results of Oslo. That's what Israel has allowed, uh, much less even than what Rabin was promising for a variety of reasons that have to do with Israeli internal politics and also the success of Hamas in undermining uh, any progress at different stages, not just with the suicide bombings that, that you mentioned that followed the Baruch Goldstein massacre in Khalil in Hebron but also the suicide bombings that took take place in the early 2000s uh, during the Second Intifada. The objective was to undermine Fatah, undermine the PLO, and to uh, uh, assert that only armed struggle can lead to the liberation of Palestine. So it was both a, you know, pumping themselves up politically and undermining the alternative course that the PLO was trying to follow. Uh, there's a little bit of that in what they did starting on October 7th, by the way. All right, so let, let's talk about October 7th. And the, I, I saw a Hamas spokesperson who said, the, if the option is to die slowly or die quickly, I'm not sure I understand the difference between the two. Uh, and so from a from an, a revolutionary insurgent standpoint, you you understand that type of, uh, of response and reaction. And then immediately after the event, I saw a lot of the the, the rhetoric. And, and again, this is just in the Western media and Western culture, so I can't speak to what the rhetoric is like in the media culture in the Middle East. But here you started to hear a lot of uh, 9-11 chatter. This is reminiscent of 9-11. This is Israel's 9-11. And I remember living in Manhattan during 9-11. I remember my own personal bloodlust that I felt at that moment, not knowing who I was angry at, just knowing I was angry. And wanting and wanting revenge, and you know, mm-hmm. knowing people that were killed that day, and so you understand, you begin to understand the dynamics of it a little differently as the time passes, and I and I imagine that that bloodlust remains among Israelis who might have been more sympathetic to a Palestinian cause, uh, even though you see that there are are some conscientious objectors that are standing up for the Palestinian cause and saying, please, at least a, at least a ceasefire, a, at a minimum a ceasefire, stop the uh, the massacre in Gaza. But um, this seems to have given the Israeli government the same type of cover that we had during 9-11 to basically just go have at it and test the limits of what is possible. And as right. we saw after 9-11, the limits of what was possible appeared limitless. I mean, our right. response was extraordinary and it was devastating. Right. And we killed right. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that were not involved uh, in any of the planning of that event. Right. And and similar, we have that again here. Right. Um, where where do the Western forces play into this in, in, in get, and, and do they have any, I mean, do they have any legitimate ability to control the events that are happening right now. I mean, let me say two things. First, about the Israeli reaction. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to talk about what Hamas intended. That's another question. The Israeli reaction on a popular level um, is, I think, has to be understood in terms of the fact that this is probably the largest 
civilian casualty toll in Israel's entire history. Yeah. The killing of 800 people on one day um, is really important in terms of Israeli history. I mean, it's, it's, being, it's being portrayed mainly in terms of Jewish history. And I don't think that Kishniev is what you should be looking at. I think you should be looking at the fact that in every single war Israel fought, it did not lose this number of civilians. Not on a single day, not in the entire course of the 48 war mm-hmm. or any other of Israel's many, many wars. Um, they lost about uh, 800 or 700 civilians, 719, I think, civilians during this second intifada from from a variety of attacks, uh, suicide bombs and otherwise, over four years. So they lost less in the second intifada civilians. I'm not talking about military casualties. Mm-hmm. Less civilians than were killed in one day in October last month. So the traumatic impact of this is incalculable. Even though Israel is a much bigger country than it was in, the Israeli polity is much bigger than 48, it's a huge casualty toll and the largest in Israel's history, civilian casualty toll. The second thing is there's the shock of the collapse of the Israeli army. Yeah. Now this is what I think the, you know, Israeli government and Israeli military is, 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 is most affected by. Of course, they're traumatized. Everybody in Israel, every, everybody I know in Israel has, knows somebody who, who was affected, either killed or right. wounded or, 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 or captured as a hostage. So that's perfectly understandable on a social level. Obviously, the leaderships of the, of the military and the government feel that, but they also feel the enormous humiliation of the collapse of the security doctrine of the fact that the Gaza division was defeated militarily. An entire division of the Israeli army, 16,000 soldiers, were overrun by Mm -hmm. Hamas? Mm -hmm. I mean, that has happened. It happened along the Suez Canal with the entire Egyptian army in 1973. It has really, I mean, this this is to the Israeli security managers who have an arrogance and a belief in their infallibility and in the, the brilliance of their concept, the conceptia, they call it. Uh, this is this this is a humiliation. This is not just a desire for revenge. This is a level of humiliation that they're going to take out on the Palestinians for a very very long time to come. Yeah. So that's the that's the that's the reaction. The reaction, the popular reaction, sh- should be easy to understand. Now you're asking about the impact on the West. Israel, in a certain sense, is us as far as many Americans are concerned. They have family there. They believe that Israelis are like Americans, whether they have family or not, whether they're Jewish or Christian or Buddhist or pagan or Muslim or whatever. People have connections there. And so it is felt in a way that the greater number of deaths in Sudan, for example, as a result of the ongoing savage civil war and and the appalling humanitarian crisis is not felt in the United States. Also, Israel is an American ally. Israel is armed by the United States. Israel benefits from UN Security Council vetoes by the United States, and so on and so forth. So it's in a different category, and and those things are felt here. Finally, think for a moment about the commanding heights of our society. These are are dominated by people who grew up in the 50s and 60s, when the only narrative was an Israeli narrative. So whether they're Jewish or they're Christian or they're, again, Buddhist or Hindu or pagan, doesn't really matter. They were marinated in a belief, in a variety of myths, whereby Israel is some kind of golden example to the world. And Biden perfectly exemplifies that, I think, and the people around him. You know, if Israel didn't exist, it would have to be invented. Uh, I am a Zionist. Uh, These are things that come from, you know, another generation. Young people don't feel this way. Even people who feel connected to Israel and are supportive of Israel, they don't feel the same way as the people who own the big corporations, who give the big campaign donations to our politicians, who sit on the boards of trustees of, of private universities. Those people, those people in their 70s and 60s, and God help us, 80s in the case of Biden, <laughs> um, live in a different world than the vast majority of Americans who are younger. And so not surprisingly, the political class is against a ceasefire in Gaza. 68% of Americans favor it, including a overwhelming majority of Democrats. So the commanding heights of our society, the people who own the media, without exception, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, they're part of that generation with that worldview. 
And so the United States is firmly aligned with Israel because that gerontocracy and th that plutocracy determines outcomes in, in politics, in corporations, on our university campuses. We have university campuses completely unresponsive to large swaths of students and large swaths of faculty because they're listening to the donors and they're listening to the trustees. They're not listening to us. They don't give a damn about us. They, they don't care about, they care about some students and some of us because the trustees and the donors are screaming at them that these people are in danger or these people feel hurt or these people uh, are not being properly treated. Um, the fact that other people feel hurt or other people are not being properly treated is a matter of little or no concern. Why? Because they, like the media, like the politicians, like the corporations, represent a, you know, a, a, an earlier mindset, a mindset of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s when these people's ideas were formed. You know, when I, when I hear uh, Jewish expressions of, um, of outrage and, and sympathies and all, all along a spectrum, I, realize, I recognize it as a spectrum, as, as one should. There is no monolithic approach on, on any side of this equation. Um, one, of the, one of the sentiments that's been expressed to me over the years is that without questioning the genesis of it, to say, well, there is no safe harbor on that side of the planet for Jews. There's only 3,500 who remain in predominantly Muslim countries. Without then going back and looking at, well, how, how did it get to be that way? Because there, there was an exodus of Jews from predominantly Muslim countries into Israel and to the United States and, other, and back into Europe and, and other parts of the world. Uh, but they they cannot they can no longer find safe harbor in, I guess, in uh, Middle Eastern countries or predominantly Muslim countries throughout Africa. Uh, so there is a sense I, again when we deal with present reality, there is a sense where Jews once again feel that sense all eyes on us and we're cornered. But now at least we have a homeland, and now we really can't let it go because there's no place else for us to go. Yeah. We've, it's been proven that we are not safe anywhere in the world. Yeah. So what I tried to do was balance the, the dialect here in, in the first series that we did to do the historical approach from the Zionist perspective and then to mirror it with the Palestinian perspective. And the more you, the more you do that, the more tragic it gets because you realize that the conservative far right wings of every movement have pushed us into this place where now nobody can move. Now we're yeah. all dug in. And yeah. so I, I wonder if if I don't even I don't even know. It's almost like I can't see if there's a good path forward for the people of Israel. Like I do believe now that they might be more compromised than they've ever been before. And the security state was exposed for what it is. They're a bully tactic state and they may not have a lot more beneath them. Right. So the uprisings will continue. The Palestinian people have connected with the rest of the young world in a way that they have never done before and that this is all going to continue. You connect with young people on the campus. In your role as a professor, you sit in so many different... Sorry. As, that's okay. No, as a professor, you, you actually... You, you're a historian, you're a professor, you can, but you also connect with young people in New right. York City in this melting pot. What are the young people telling you? Because I know progressives are going to be under fire and younger Democrats are going to be under fire, uh, certainly in the next election cycle. But you see that right. expression directly. What are you feeling? Oh, I mean, you've opened up three or four things and I, this is going to be the last question. So let me answer all Understood. three. Try and answer a couple of them. The first thing is the this sense of being beleaguered um, has, th there's reason behind it. Israel is beleaguered. I don't just mean militarily or on the ground in Palestine. Israel is beleaguered because of its own actions primarily, but it is beleaguered. World public opinion has been aroused in a way that it hasn't been for a very long time. And it's aroused because it sees a broader picture than just Jewish suffering. It sees, in fact, there was great sympathy worldwide in the first days after the October 7th attack for Jewish suffering, for Israeli suffering. Um, India, uh, every part of the world, including many people in the Arab world, were horrified and shocked. Some people celebrated, no question. But I think the overwhelming global reaction, not just in, in, in the United States and the Western countries, globally, was one of intense sympathy and horror and shock. And it's well worth paying attention to why that diminished very rapidly. It diminished because of what Israel does, because people were reminded they kill so many people 
each time one of their people is killed. That is not a coincidence. That is a policy. It has been a policy for 75 years. It was taught to the Israeli generals who started commanding the Israeli army back in the 40s by British counterinsurgency experts. That's how colonial powers operate. You have to kill enough of them to impress on the natives that only that, that, that we have overwhelming force. Well, I hate to say, say this, but that's been a failed strategy. It hasn't worked. It didn't work in the 40s. It didn't work in the 50s. It's not going to work this time. And it doesn't sell well in the formerly colonized world because they all tasted that lash of colonialism. The Chinese, the Indians, the Indonesians, the Bangladeshis, the Nigerians, the Brazilians, the people of the world, the billions of people in the world, all come from a colonial background. And their sympathy diminished very rapidly when they saw thousands and thousands and thousands of Palestinians dying after, tragically, after 800 Israeli civilians died, tragically. And unfortunately for Israel, one life in most people's eyes is equivalent to another life. And there's no privileging of one life as having a kind of sanctity that other lives don't have. So they've, they're, they are beleaguered globally, yeah. not just in the Arab world. And they are, I, I think, to a certain extent, sensing that that even extends to the West. Because young people, I think, have the same, not all of them, but many of them have the same measure. They say what, what happened in, on the 7th was horrific, but what is happening is horrific too. And that Israel and many of its supporters don't seem to, Israeli government and many of its supporters don't seem to see that, is a problem for them. Now, you, 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 you've correctly said that um, progressive Democrats are, going to be, Democrats are going to be under pressure in the year to come and in years to come, perhaps. And I think you're right. Progressive Democrats have an overwhelming majority of Democratic voters on their side. So if the big money and the machines crush them, the Democratic Party will lose in the end. Yeah. And that may well happen. Uh, APAC will spend unlimited amounts to defeat Jamal Bowman or to defeat AOC or to defeat Ilhan Omar or to defeat Rashid Tlaib. And I'm sure that in some cases they will succeed. But they represent an overwhelming majority of the Democratic Party base. Minorities, young people, and in many cases, Arab and Muslim communities in, say, swing states like Michigan. So if yeah. President Biden loses in October and November next, it won't just be because he's incoherent or he's doddering or because his policies are rejected by many Americans. It will partly perhaps be because he's alienated that base of the Democratic Party. I mean, when black churches put a uh, pastors of black churches put a full page ad in The New York Times calling for a ceasefire, maybe somebody in the White House ought to ring a bell and wake the president up and tell him, yo, whatever you think about Israel or Palestine, mm -hmm. and he clearly doesn't think about Palestine, whatever you think about Israel, maybe you might want to consider the impact of this and of the Democratic Party machine's roller, steamroller effort to crush the progressives. So that's, that's what I have to say about that. Um, as far as what young people think, well, young people are <laughs> obviously extremely diverse. And I only come in contact with a very tiny cross-section of them. I mean, I teach at Columbia. Columbia is not a, 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 I don't think Columbia is a very good example necessarily. It's not a, you know, per, if, if I were doing statistics, I wouldn't take the Columbia campuses. <laughs> you know, we had an overwhelming vote in favor of divestment on, on the part of our student body, both at Barnard and at Columbia four years ago, or mm. four, three, four, whatever years ago. Mm. Um, that was the sentiment of the students then. Sentiment hasn't changed. There are many people who are supportive of Israel. There are many people who are not sure, but there are very large numbers of people among the student body who really see this war uh, in, in, in a specific light that's not very favorable to Israel. Uh, even people who have family in Israel, even people who are, you know, a, 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 a large proportion of these are Jewish students who are marching and who are, are, are feel oppressed by the administration and so forth. Um, now, I, I think that, however, is representative of certainly elite universities. I think it's representative to a lesser extent of, of college campuses generally. Um, and I think that if you go into other places than universities, you go into minority communities, you find a great deal of sympathy for the Palestinians. Um, that's true in various other niches of American society. 
I can't speak to those niches. I mean, I meet people from different, you know, ethnicities and, and from different backgrounds. And I get that sense. But I can tell you that as far as students are concerned, um, there is an openness, uh, a, a, a critical uh, faculty and an ability to see, you know, two sides of a question that simply didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. Um, it's not just the support for Palestine has increased. Young people are critical and, and open minded about all of these narratives. Professor, I know we're up on time, uh, so I, I hope you will come back again. I'd love to extend the discussion. I, I, I And again, I also want to thank you for your work. I think it's been a tremendous service, and I know that you have family in Palestine. Uh, so my thoughts are with you, and I'm sure our audience's thoughts are with you, and I hope that we can uh, connect again soon. But thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. I hope we will have that chance.